Well, today it's a special pleasure to welcome Mike Clancy to the World Affairs Council. Uh, Mike's reputation as an accomplished scientist and um, excellent uh, communicator precedes him. Uh, and I'm, I have learned that he is especially passionate about the topic that he's going to talk about today. Mike earned his bachelor's degree in oceanography from the Florida Institute of Technology and his master's degree in meteorology from the University of Miami. Uh, after working with Science Applications International Corporation back in the 70s, uh, he joined the Naval Research Lab in the early 80s, and then the staff of the U.S. Navy's Fleet Numerical Meteorology and Oceanography Center here in Monterey. Uh, in 2005, he was appointed technical and scientific director of that center. Mike has authored over 100 publications in meteorology, uh, oceanography, and information technology, and he has received over 50 professional awards, including the Navy's highest civilian award. The title of his presentation today is the climate crisis, a major challenge for the world. I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'd also want to thank uh, Larry and Chris and all members of the board of this group for inviting me here today. I particularly want to thank Jim Emerson and Judy for setting this up for me. I really appreciate it. And most of all, I want to thank all of you for coming to listen to this topic. Now, I'm going to cover a lot of material. I tend to move kind of fast. I tend to kind of talk fast. I'm going to show you a lot of technical material. If it's not making sense to you, please raise your hand and stop me and make sure that you understand what I'm showing you. Uh, there's going to be a lot of science in this thing. Here's a quick introduction or outline of what we're going to be talking about. And let's see, can you see that mouse there? Okay. Uh, introduction and context then uh, on climate change, there's going to be a lot of science there. Now, if you don't have a science background, it might be a little bit painful. Uh, people have described it as being somewhere between a uh, root canal and tooth extraction. <laughs> Hang in there with me, because uh, you'll get something out of it, and it'll be good. Then we'll move on to talking about the relative impacts of greenhouse gases on global warming, sources of the sinks of CO2, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, international agreements, including the Paris Climate Accord, uh, mitigation, and finally end up with some closing comments. So, I want to begin with uh, taking you back, way back, five million years back, to look at the global mean surface temperature of the Earth from the present time here, about five million years. And what you see is that about two and a half million years ago, at the beginning of what's called the Pleistocene epoch, the Earth entered into ice age cycles. And you can see these up and down cycles here. Now, technically, the upward um, cycle is called the glacial, interglacial period, and the downward spike is called the glacial period. But uh, typically, we use the term ice age to, to indicate the, the glacial period, the cold period. That's the term I'm going to use today. Now, about, uh, about a million years ago, or the first one and a half million years, we were in a 40,000 year ice age cycle, and that transitioned to about a 100,000 year ice age cycle for the past million years. So why am I showing you this? Why am I talking about ice ages? That's because the anthropogenic or the human-produced uh, climate change we are experiencing, the global warming we are experiencing, happens against the backdrop of this natural climate uh, change. And so we need to understand this natural climate change so we can understand the human-induced climate change that we're concerned with. So the question on the table is, do we understand what's going on here? And the answer is absolutely we do. We absolutely understand it. In fact, we've understood the Ice Age cycle for about 100 years. And in fact, the Ice Age cycle is driven by variations in the Earth's orbit around the Sun and variations in the orientation of the Earth in space. That's what drives the Ice Age cycle. Now, I'm sure you know that the Earth orbits the Sun in an ellipse, such that in Northern Hemisphere summer, the Earth is actually farther away from the Sun in Northern Hemisphere winter, and the Earth is closer to the Sun. That's good for us, those of us who live in the Northern Hemisphere, because that makes the summers cooler and the winters warmer. But that ellipse is not fixed in time. 
it varies on a 100,000 year ice age cycle from being more elongated, this is exaggerated here in this figure, but being more elongated to less elongated. And that's driven by the gravitational effect of Jupiter and Saturn on the Earth. 100,000 year cycle has a profound impact on climate change. <clears throat> also, I'm sure you're aware that the Earth's axis is tilted relative to the plane that the Earth is orbiting the Sun in. And of course, that's what gives us the seasons. In Northern Hemisphere summer, the North Pole is tilted towards the Sun. In Northern Hemisphere winter, the North Pole is tilted away from the Sun. But that is not fixed in time either. In fact, the Earth rocks back and forth uh, on a, a 41,000-year cycle between about 24.5 degrees and 22.5 degrees. And that's driven by the gravitational effect of the Sun and the Moon on the Earth. And then finally, um, you're probably aware that uh, the North Star is in fact uh, uh, Polaris. The North Pole points to the star Polaris. But 13 and a half years from now, the North, the North Pole will point toward the star Vega because in fact the Earth wobbles. The Earth wobbles in what's called the precession cycle on about a 27,000 year cycle. So what does this have to do with climate or, or climate change? Well, it works like this. When these orbital variations conspire to yield decreasing solar radiation striking the Earth during northern hemisphere summer, that begins to take us into an ice age. Why northern hemisphere summer? Well, because the northern hemisphere is where most of the land is. And what really tends to amplify this effect is something called the snow ice feedback effect. And it works like this. Decreasing global temperatures yield increasing snow and ice persisting through the summertime in the high latitudes. That snow and ice is highly reflective, so it reflects the, the sunlight away, and that results in even more decreasing global temperatures. And you go around this positive feedback loop, it amplifies the cooling. Similarly, there is this water vapor feedback loop. As the Earth is cooling and as the oceans are cooling, uh, there's decreasing evaporation from, of water from the oceans and land. That decreases the water vapor in the atmosphere. The atmosphere becomes less humid because water vapor is a very strong greenhouse gas trapping uh, long wave radiation that also uh, decreases the global temperature to go around this feedback loop and it cool, amplifies the cooling. Similarly, there is something called the CO2 feedback loop which amplifies the cooling. Important thing to note here, these three feedback loops do not drive global warming. They cannot drive global warming. It takes external forcing in the form of these orbital variations to drive the global warming. These three feedback loops only <coughs> amplify the global warming. Without the external forcing caused by these orbital variations, we wouldn't have any global warming. So this yields a transition to an ice age. And similarly, uh, 50,000 years later or so, as these orbital variations conspire to increase solar radiation striking the Earth during northern hemisphere summer. So for example, that would be a case of the Earth um, uh, become drawing closer to the sun, and uh, in other words, this ellipse becoming more like a circle and less drawn out like an ellipse. That yields increasing solar radiation striking the Earth, and you go around the feedback loops in the opposite direction, the amplified warming that takes you out of the ice age. And we understood this for about 100 years. There was a Serbian uh, astronomer by the name of Lutin Milankovic, who figured this out back in the 1920s. No surprises here. So. Now I'm going to take you zooming in. I'm going to zoom in now way over here to the very last ice age and into the current warm period we're in, which is called the Holocene Warm Period. We're going to be looking back 22,000 years. And it looks like this. What we were looking at here again is global mean surface temperature of the Earth. Global mean means average over the face of the Earth. Surface temperature over the past 22,000 years. The green part here to the far left is in fact the last ice age. And what we see is there is this warming trend here, which is driven by the eccentricity cycle. That means the Earth was moving closer to the Sun during the hemisphere summer. And then we entered into the warm period, which is called the Holocene. But then there was a cooling trend headed toward the next ice age for the last 10,000 years. And that cooling trend is driven by the obliquity cycle, which means the Earth is losing tilt. Over the last 10,000 years, the Earth has lost about a half a degree of angular tilt. And that has caused this slow cooling trend here. Now, there are a couple other, and oh, by the way, human civilization began right about here, about 9,000 years ago. So all of human civilization has occurred in this warm period, the Holocene period. A couple other identifiable features on this, on this chart, on this graph. Uh, this is this, about a 1,500 year 
interruption in the warming is called the Younger Dryas period. Dryas is a type of flower that uh, flourished during this period. And this was caused by influx of fresh water from melting glaciers affecting the ocean's thermal halon circulation. That's the, you might have heard about the overturning of the ocean circulation. It's called the ocean conveyor belt. This affected that, and that causes brief interruption in, in warming. But as the Earth grew closer to the sun, that was overcome, and we continued to warm until we got into the uh, warm period. This little bump here is called the medieval warm period. This happened between about 9, 900 and 1300 AD. It was caused by an increase in, in uh, the solar radiation, so it was, was burning a little bit brighter then. And also there was a reduction in, in uh, aerosols because of less in the atmosphere caused by uh, fewer uh, volcanoes. Well, this little dip right here is called the Little Ice Age. This happened uh, back in uh, Elizabethan England. Most famously, the River Thames froze over. And again, the sun played a role in that. And then finally, we have this spike, this red spike, which in fact is the post-industrial global warming that we are concerned about. Now, there are a couple of things that are immediately apparent on this, on this graph. The first thing is, the global warming we're concerned with is going in the wrong direction. The Earth has been cooling for the last 10,000 years. It should continue to cool, but suddenly we're warming. It's going in the wrong direction uh, relative to natural climate change. And the other thing is, it's going really fast. In fact, it's going 20 times faster than natural climate change. This is what natural climate change looks like. This is what the global warming we're concerned with looks like. It's going 20 times too fast and in the wrong direction. So what does 20 times too fast in the wrong direction mean? Well, Suppose you are a golfer, and you're golfing over here at Quebec Lodge. And you're in your golf cart, unfortunately you make a wrong turn, and you find yourself westbound on Carmel Valley Road in this golf cart. And unfortunately it's cartwheel. And coming in the opposite direction is a Lamborghini going 200 miles an hour. They can go that fast, and they occasionally do go that fast. <laughs> well, that's the difference here. Natural climate change is the golf cart puttering along at 10 miles an hour. But the climate change we've been experiencing in the past century is the Lamborghini going 200 miles an hour in the other direction. Now, you would never confuse that Lamborghini with the golf cart. You should never confuse what we're seeing in terms of global warming with natural climate change. It is not natural climate change. So, I'm going to zoom in now on this red spike. We're going to look at the last 120 years or so. And what we're looking at here again is, again, global mean surface temperature of the Earth from 1850 to 2017 from five different sources. The Japanese Meteorological Agency, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, United Kingdom Meteorological Office, and then two U.S. products, one from NASA and one from the um, different colors here. Now, all these five independent products produced by five independent groups using different kinds of data. In some cases, they're using computer models, others not. In some cases, they're using satellite data, others not. They all paint the same picture, and the picture is, is as follows. Not much happening from 1850 to 1880, slight decline from 1880 to 1910. Pretty strong upward trend from 1910 to 45. Slight decline from 45 to 75. And then beginning in the mid-70s, a strong upward trend in temperature, such that we are now running about a little more than one degree centigrade above the pre-industrial level. A couple things to note here. The temperature doesn't go up in a straight line. It's kind of like the stock market. There's volatility here. You get this volatility going on. You have periods of bear markets, periods of, of, of uh, bull markets, but it doesn't go up in a straight line. Also, notice how, how much agreement there is between the data, particularly in the, in the modern era, because we have a plethora of data out there to observe, observe our, our planet and understand climate change. Now, I'm going to show you an animation of one of these. In particular, I'm going to show you an animation of the NASA surface temperature analysis product. And what we're going to be looking at here um, it's about a 100-year animation of temperature anomaly. Now, temperature anomaly is just a fancy way of saying temperature difference. So this is the temperature difference between the 30-year average from 1950 to 1980 uh, for every location on the Earth. Where you see white, that means the temperature is the same as that 30-year average, 1951 to 1980. Where you see yellow or orange, it's warmer. Uh, and here's the scale here. Yellow is 0 to 1 degrees C warmer. And orange is 1 to 2 degrees warmer. Light blue is 0 to 1 degrees cooler. And dark blue is maybe 2 degrees cooler. Um, I'm going to call out the decades here. So you can just focus on the colors changing. But I'm going to call out the decades and pay particular attention to what happens in the 70s. But first, a couple things about this data. First of all, it's a lot of data. 
It's, it's based on about 350 million observations over the oceans, mainly from ships, but in recent years supplemented by drifting buoys out there. Over the land, it's several billion observations. There are 27,000 land stations around the world that report um, a couple times a day, some cases hourly. Lots of data there. You might have heard about the urban heat, line, heat island effect, which is a real effect. Uh, cities will register temperatures warmer than the surrounding rural areas because of all the concrete and, and so forth. Don't worry about it. It's taken care of here. It's 270 stations that are filtered out of this analysis because they were deemed to be contaminated by the urban heat island, heat island effect. So don't worry about the urban heat island effect. It doesn't play a role here. You might be aware that prior to 1920, sea surface temperature measurements from ships were made by throwing a bucket over the side of Poynda, <laughs> sticking a the thermometer in there, and reading off. From, 20, from 1920 to about 1960, there was a transition from bucket temperatures to engine room injection temperatures, where the temperature was read from the, the injection of, of uh, seawater into the engine room to cool the, the engine. Why am I mentioning that? Well, that's, the reason I'm mentioning that is it's very well known that bucket temperatures were biased, cooled by about one degree centigrade, whereas the engine room injection temperatures are biased more by about three degrees centigrade. It's pretty warm down those engine rooms. And that would be like a four tenths degree change, and that would be significant, but don't worry about that. It's been corrected out. Lots of scholarly papers written on this, and all those issues have been corrected out. So, I'm going to show this animation. I'll call out the years and pay particular attention to what happens in the 1970s, and we'll and we'll draw some conclusions about what we see. Here we go. Okay, in the uh, 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, and we end up at 2010s, we have a 2018. So, a couple things here. Uh, first of all, the land is warming faster than the sea. In fact, the land is warming about twice as fast as the sea. Even though the sea is actually accumulating about 95% of the heat of global warming. So why is it warming less? It's because the ocean has much, much higher heat capacity, about 100 times the heat capacity of the land. That's the ability to absorb heat and not warm up very much. So the ocean is warming for sure, but not as fast as the land, even though most of the heat is going into the ocean. The higher latitudes are warming the most. In fact, the more you go north, the more it gets warmer. The Arctic area is warming the most of any place on Earth. And that's not good, because of course that's where lots of ice is, particularly the Greenland ice sheet. And as that melts, that contributes to sea level rise. Notice that the western quarter of North America, where we live, is warming faster than the rest of North America. We're warming about twice as fast as the East Coast. In fact, I can tell you that Monterey County, since 1900, has warmed about 1.9 degrees centigrade, whereas the overall global temperature is only about, about 1 degree centigrade. So we've warmed about twice the rate of the global, global warming. And also note that it's not warming everywhere. There are some blue areas here, particularly over the ocean. The big blue blotch here has to do with changes in the, in the Gulf Stream. Uh, blue blotch here, you know, along Antarctica has to do with changes in the Antarctic circumpolar climate. So as the climate changes, ocean circulation also changes, and that can contribute to areas where um, the Earth is not warming. Which leads to a very famous quote, a quote that I made it myself. It's my favorite quote. You can quote me on it, and that is, the word global in global warming stands for global. <laughs> global and global warming stands for global. You really need to be talking about the global picture, not any individual picture. For example, let's say you uh, had a buoy out here and you're looking at the, the temperature over the past 100 years in this location here, you'd say, the Earth is getting colder. But in fact, it's not representative of what's going on. You really need to look at the entire globe to draw a conclusion about global warming. So what's going on here? Do we understand what's going on here? And the answer is we absolutely do. It's the greenhouse effect, and it's not that complicated. It's not, it's not uh, uh, general relativity, it's not uh, quantum mechanics, it's not even rocket science. It's pretty straightforward. And to understand it, we need to first look at and understand the Earth's uh, radiation budget. And it looks like this. There's incoming solar radiation, which uh, some of it hits the ground, some is reflected off clouds, some reflects off the ground, goes back out to space. And there's outgoing long-wave radiation, it's also known as infrared radiation. 
and that's radiated from the ground, it's, it's radiated from clouds. And what's going on here, oh by the way, notice I don't show anything on this chart that has to do with anything like uh, heat from the center of the Earth. We know that the Earth is, is molten and there's heat coming up from the center of the Earth. After all, that's how geothermal energy works, so why don't I have that on here? Because it's negligibly small. Negligibly small, hundreds of times smaller than the income sol incoming solar radiation. Mm -hmm. What about waste heat from buildings? We've got all these buildings and heaters and air conditioners and all that, steel mills, negligibly small. Millions of times smaller than the heat from the sun. What about tidal friction? Tides are running around and there's frictional heating. Millions of times smaller than, than, this, than this radiation from the sun. This really is flogging in terms of whether the Earth is warming up or cooling down. It's really the radiation balance at the top of the atmosphere. So, it goes like this. Incoming solar radi radiation warms the Earth. It's warming the Earth right up there right now, coming the sun. And the Earth is cooled in two ways. It's cooled by reflected solar radiation. Some of it is reflected off clouds. And aerosols in the atmosphere. Aerosols are uh, particles that spit in the atmosphere like smoke or dust or uh, air pollution. And some is reflected from the surface, particularly areas that are covered by snow and ice. And the Earth is also cooled by outgoing long wave radiation. Um, which uh, radiates from the top of clouds and from the surface of the Earth. And then finally, the greenhouse gases trap the outgoing long wave radiation and warm the, the lower atmosphere and the surface of the Earth. So here are the greenhouse gases. These, these are the gases that are, that are the primary ones in the atmosphere that trap this radiation and warm the Earth. Uh, H2O is water vapor, which we perceive as humidity. CO2 is carbon dioxide. Uh, CH4 methane, N2O, uh, nitrous oxide, and finally the F gases. The F gases or the fluorinated gases are man-made gases that have fluorine in the molecule, and they are typically things like refrigerants, um, uh, gaseous insulators, solvents, and things like that. So, finally, human activities are increasing the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and increasing the warming. First of all, it's good that we have this greenhouse effect going on, because if we didn't have it, if we suddenly ma magically wave a magic wand and eliminate the greenhouse properties of all these gases, the Earth would cool dramatically. In fact, we would go into a permanent ice age. And we'd be under, right now, an ice sheet hundreds of meters thick. So we need that. It's kind of like when you go to sleep at night, you want a blanket. I mean, you you want not be comfortable you don't have that blanket. On the other hand, if people keep piling blankets on overnight, blanket after blanket, Pretty soon, you're going to get two more. Well, that's what's happening. We're piling blanket after blanket on here as we are driving up these uh, greenhouse gases. Note that I colored water vapor different. It's not water vapor does contribute to global warming through that water vapor feedback loop we talked about before, just as it affects the ice age cycle. But it does not drive global warming. What drives global warming? And that's because it's in balance with the hydrologic cycle, and it's not increasing unless the hydrologic cycle warm nudges it to, to increase. What's really happening are, what's really the concern are these anthropogenic greenhouse gases here, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and the fluorinated gases. Now this is not just me talking. All I'm presenting to you is the overwhelming international scientific, scientific consensus on this matter. And there is indeed an overwhelming international scientific consensus on this matter. And it's reflected in this list, partial list, of leading science organizations that have made formal declarations confirming human-induced global warming exactly the lines of what I've described to you. And that includes the three most prestigious organizations in the United States, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the U.S. National Research Council, American Association for the Advancement of Science, as well as the two organizations that have curfew over the, over the ocean and the atmosphere and that's the American Geophysical Union and the American Meteorological Society. Overwhelming international scientific consensus on this matter. The science is settled and has been settled for many years. So, this is where we are right now. Um, one degree centigrade above the pre-industrial level. Where are we going? Well, it depends on what we do. With we, being the people of the world, if we um, adhere to the most stringent Recommendations of the Paris Climate Accord, which means we would achieve carbon neutrality by the year 2050. Now, carbon neutrality means uh, we're putting no more CO2 in the atmosphere every year than the natural carbon cycle can take it out. 
that means we have to reduce uh, CO2 emissions by about a factor of two, which is a heavy lift, but that's what we would have to do to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade by the end of the century, 2100. So that's one outcome. The other outcome is if we just continue on business as usual. For example, if the rest of the world follows the lead of the United States and pulls out every climate accord and pretends the whole thing is a hoax to continue on business as usual, this is where we're going, way up here. And that would be 4.5 degrees centigrade, plus or minus one, above the uh, pre-industrial level. And the reason why I'd like to show that with the 22,000 year view here is it gives you a sense of, of how extreme this is compared to where what the natural climate change is. This was the last ice age here, and we're warming as much above this level than, than we were cooling to go into the last ice age. That's pretty extreme. So what are the consequences of, of that, that degree of warming and climate change? Well, the BBC produced a really nice video sort of summarizing uh, 2019, what the impacts were in 2019. So I'm going to play that for you. It just runs a couple minutes here. What do we know about the impact of climate change on the world's weather this year? Let's start in the Arctic. Summer 2019 has seen Arctic ice 30% below normal. This region is heating up about twice the average of the rest of the world and is caught in what scientists call a positive feedback loop. That's where sea ice thins and melts, opening up vast expanses of dark ocean that absorbs more heat from the sun causing further warming. This dramatic warming of the Arctic may affect the strength and position of the jet stream, which brings the weather to the likes of North America and Europe. Globally, July 2019 was the hottest month ever recorded, and the Northern Hemisphere had the hottest summer on record. France and the UK were just two of the many European countries to see their temperature record broken. Studies showed the heat wave in France was made at least five times more likely by climate change. July was also Alaska's hottest month in recorded history. Wildfires there and elsewhere in the Arctic Circle are estimated to have released 50 megatons of CO2 in just one month, the equivalent of Sweden's annual carbon output. Wildfires hit the UK too, but in February, temperatures reached over 20 Celsius for the first time ever in winter. And on the other side of the world, Australia saw its hottest January on record, prompting health warnings and total fire bans. But by the laws of physics, a warmer world could hold more water vapour and potentially lead to more severe rainfall events. While the link between climate change and the Indian monsoon is uncertain, Mumbai has seen record summer monsoon rainfall totals. Iran suffered devastating floods in the spring of this year, as exceptional rainfall followed a prolonged period of drought. In Africa, Cyclone Edai was described by the UN as one of the worst natural disasters ever to hit the southern hemisphere. Heavy rain and coastal flooding led to the deaths of more than 700 people. Storms like these are expected to become stronger in a warming world. And in September, Hurricane Dorian became the second most powerful Atlantic hurricane in recorded history. Gusts of 220 miles per hour were measured in the Bahamas. An estimated 35 inches of rain fell together with a huge storm surge. Sea level rise is already threatening other island communities, such as the Maldives. The Paris Agreement aims to pursue efforts to limit the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But even under that scenario, sea level could rise by up to 77 centimetres by the end of this century. So 2019 has seen many examples of extreme weather that scientists predict could become the new norm in a warming world. Okay, nice summary of what transpired last year. Now I'm going to drill down a little bit more into uh, the consequences here. And I'd like to divide the consequences into two categories, natural consequences and human consequences. So natural consequences, don't, natural consequences are those on the natural world. So just a quick uh, summary here. Increasing temperature of the land, ocean, and lower troposphere. And this is something people may not be so much aware of. And that is the global warming is really only warming the lowest half of the troposphere. The troposphere is the lowest layer of the atmosphere where the weather occurs. Mm. And it extends from about the surface up to about 40,000 feet, about to the level where you fly in a jet airliner. Only the lowest, 
lower half of that is warming. The lower troposphere, the low, lowest 20,000 feet of the atmosphere is warming. Above that is actually cooling. Why is it cooling up here? Well, because the heat that would normally warm it is being trapped below. Well, that's a way of that's that's causing the atmosphere to become more unstable. You're heating the atmosphere from below, cooling it from above because warm air rises, and that warm air rising is a major source for the energy that drives storms. You're making the atmosphere more unstable, and that's giving rise to increased uh, severe weather. Uh, and that's increasing intensity, frequency and intensity of severe storms. Also increasing frequency of life-threatening heat waves as the planet gets warmer. It turns out heat waves kill more people globally than any other weather phenomenon, more than tornadoes, more than hurricanes, you name it. It's really heat waves. And heat waves are becoming more intense and more, more common. Well, this here gets a little bit uh, tricky. Increasing absolute humidity, which is the water content of the air, that's increasing the, the frequency and intensity of floods in wet regions. In, re in regions where you have no trouble forming rain, like the southeastern United States, for example, you're raining from an atmosphere that's more moist, and that gives rise to more intense rainfall events, more flooding events. However, at the same time, all of the, the, rel the absolute humidity, which is the water content of the air, is going up. The relative humidity, which is the likelihood of precipitation, is going down. That's because the air is warming. And as the air warms, it can hold more and more water. So what that does is in areas where normally dry areas, like here, where it's hard to get to 100% relative humidity and form rain up in the clouds, it's going to become even harder. And so we're looking at dry areas becoming drier because of this decrease in relative humidity, but wet areas becoming wetter and more prone to flooding because of this increase in absolute humidity. Um, and that, of course, will affect us through increasing frequency of droughts and wildfires in our dry seasons. Also, decreasing snowfall relative to rainfall, because as the air warms, there's less a tendency for the precipitation to fall as snow, and more of a tendency to fall as rain. That's not good here in California, because a lot of our ability to get through the dry season is based on developing good snowpack in the Sierras, but that snowpack would be decreasing. Less snow falling, and the melt season beginning earlier. Melting ice sheets and glaciers, giving, giving, uh, producing rising sea levels. <laughs> Big problem, decreasing pH of seawater, which is known as ocean acidification. That's a big problem for coral reefs, for example. Decreasing oxygen levels in the ocean, increasing mortality of coral reefs, known as coral bleaching. Decreasing productivity of fisheries, even including the fisheries off our coast here. And finally, increasing species migrations and extinctions. About 8% of the species in the world, 8% are currently at risk because of climate change. That's really a huge number. Now, in terms of human consequences of the warming world, we're talking about increasing economic costs resulting from increasing frequency and intensity of damaging weather events, increasing prevalence of wildfires, and rising sea levels. Increasing competition among nations for water and food caused by increasing drought, increasing agriculture, and increasing fisheries production. Increasing threat of disease as tropical diseases spread in the higher latitudes. The outbreak of the Zika virus in South Florida a couple years ago was a good example of this moving up from Central America. Increasing displacements of people and unrest in populations susceptible to recruitment by violent extremist groups caused by increasing drought, floods, extreme weather, and sea level rise. This is a big concern to um, the U.S. Department of Defense because um, they see climate change as being, quote, an accelerant to instability, unquote. It gives rise to uh, the more likelihood of, of instability in the world. We've already seen it in a number of places. Increasing human mortality from heat waves, other severe events, starvation, disease, and war. And the risks are unevenly distributed between groups of people and between regions. Risks are generally greater for disadvantaged people living in developing countries. For example, from sea level rise. Most of the impacts of sea level rise are going to hit Asia. Uh, Bangladesh is sort of ground zero for sea level rise. Bangladesh is one of the poorest countries in the world, also one of the most densely populated and low-lying countries in the world. A one meter rise in sea level will displace about 30 million people in Bangladesh. And the question is, where are they going? Well, they're not going to India, because there's a wall there, and there's machine guns, and they'll kill them. They're probably not going to Myanmar. They don't want the meter, so where are they going to go? It's a big problem. It's a humanitarian crisis. A one meter rise in sea level, which is what is currently predicted, for the end of this, uh, this century, will displace about 100 million people globally, most of them in Asia, 30 million in Bangladesh. 
A two meter rise in sea level will displace about 200, 200 million people globally. And that's, you know, humanitarian crisis and, and, and contributed to instability. Where are they going? Generally speaking, climate change is putting pressure on the basics of life. Food, water, and living space. Food, water, and living space. Think about it. Those are kind of the basics of life. And climate change is, is really putting pressure in those three areas. Not a pretty picture. So, kind of drive that home. Think about this. From the beginning of human civilization to the beginning of the 20th century, the climate was really very stable. You look from here 9,000 years ago to the beginning of the 20th century, we cooled by maybe a half a degree centigrade. It was pretty, pretty darn stable. And now look where we're going. Somewhere between these two arrows, and most likely closer to this arrow than that arrow. That's a very, very radical change over a very short period of time. Can civilization adapt to that? Answer the question. The real concern. So, before we transition to talking about sort of the policy matters, I want to drill down a little bit more into the greenhouse gases. Uh, again, these are the, the greenhouse gases. And here you're seeing the, the, the snapshot of time, the contribution of these different greenhouse gases to the current rate of global warming. Carbon dioxide is the dominant green, greenhouse gas in terms of the global warming, accounting for about 72%, followed by methane, also known as natural gas, 20%. Uh, Nitrous oxide, mainly caused by or emitted from uh, agricultural operations, about 5%. And finally, the fluorinated gas is about 2%. One thing you should know about this is the potency of these gases actually increases dramatically as you go down this list here. For example, the fluorinated gases, although they're only accounting for 2% of the current warming, they are thousands of times more potent than, than uh, carbon dioxide. The only reason they're contributing a small amount is because there isn't much of them in the atmosphere. We need to keep it that way. The big issue there is making sure that refrigerators and, and, and uh, Air conditioners are properly recycled. You simply throw them on the landfill, like you know, might happen throughout Asia. Um, those those devices will will, will uh, rust, and the fluorinated gases will be emitted to the atmosphere, and that's a huge contributor. Could become a huge contributor to global warming. So CO2 is the dominant contributor to the current rate of global warming. And here's what CO2 looks like over time. What we're looking at here is CO2 concentration in parts per million from uh, 1700 to 2019. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, CO2 was running about uh, 280 parts per million. It's now above 400. And you can see, particularly beginning about the 1950s, it really took off. This is called, often referred to as the Keeling Curve, after uh, Charles, Charles Keeling, an uh, oceanographer at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, who made the most detailed measurements of CO2. And um, it's increased by about 50% over the pre-industrial level. Another way of looking at it, at it is the mass of CO2 that's been emitted into the atmosphere. From 1850 to 2018, human activities have amounted to about 2 trillion tons. 2 trillion, not billion, 2 trillion tons of CO2 emissions. And about half that is still there. About 1.1 trillion tons are there above the industrial level. And we're currently emitting CO2 at the rate of about 40 billion tons per year. Generally speaking, we're putting CO2 into the atmosphere about twice as fast as the natural carbon cycle can take it out. We get to that carbon neutral place that, that, uh, that um, the Paris Climate Accord calls for, we would have to cut CO2 emissions by about a factor of about two. Now, about 30% of CO2 emitted uh, gets sequestered in the ground, and that's good, that's what we want. About 20% gets absorbed into the ocean. That's good that it's not in the atmosphere, but not so good for the ocean because that contributes to uh, ocean acidification and is harmful for marine life. And the remaining 50% goes into the atmosphere. And that's the part which is causing this curve to go up and up and up and for the planet to continue to warm. So what are the sources of sinks of CO2? Well, um, globally, now this is not just the US, this is globally, the primary source of CO2 or the primary production is, is in fact energizing the power grid. And that accounts for about 25% of CO2 emissions, just producing the electric power grid, power to, to, to uh, give us electricity. About 24% is agriculture, forestry, and other land use, particularly land and beef production and deforestation. Deforestation is a huge source of, of CO2. 
And the next one is about 21% is industrial production, particularly steel and cement production. Between those three uh, sectors, that accounts for almost uh, two-thirds of global CO2 emissions. Note that transportation is actually pretty small globally. Transportation, transportation sector, which is all car, cars, trucks, buses, trains, planes, and ships, globally is only about 14%. Much higher for the U.S. because we drive a lot more, but globally it's actually pretty low. Then we have uh, fossil fuel production, that would be petroleum refineries, about 10%. And finally, <coughs> on-site fossil fuel burning in buildings and homes, that would be heating, cooking, and natural gas. So that's kind of the emissions by sector. Here are the emissions by country. Um, China's number one. See, the simplest way to look at this is, what's, who's producing the, the most total emissions per year by country, and China's number one, by a pretty big margin, by a factor of two. By factor about two over the United States in second place. European uh, Union falls there, India, Russia, Japan, and it goes down pretty fast. There's really three ways of looking at emissions. One is just what country is putting out the most, and the answer is China by a wide margin. Bring a lot of a lot of coal over there to try to industrialize. But another way of looking at it is the per capita emissions. And that means you simply take the total production by the country, divide by the number of people in the country. Well, there's a lot of people in China. So China drops pretty far down the list, and the United States becomes number one. We have the highest per capita carbon footprint of any nation. But we're not alone there, because Canada, Saudi Arabia, and Australia are pretty close behind us. Uh, per capita carbon emissions, or CO2 emissions, for the U.S. is about 17 tons. So the average American accounts for about 17 tons of CO2 emissions per year. Good news for California, the average emissions for California per capita is only about 11 tons. So we're quite a bit better than the national average. I like to say it's because we're really, we're really um, you know, progressive and green and so forth. But also it has to do with the fact that we don't have any, many smokestack industries. And of course, we have very, very well of butter. And then there's a third way of looking at it. And the third way of looking at it is, what countries have contributed the most cumulatively over the past century to uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere, and, which is another way of saying, what countries cumulatively have contributed the most to our current global warming, and guess what? We're number one by a wide margin. 27% of the CO2 that's in the atmosphere right now has been produced there, put there by the United States. All 27 or 28 countries here of the, of the European Union come behind us. China is pretty far down, only 11 percent, and um, the, re the remaining 160 or so countries in the world that are not on this list contribute less than in the United States. So we put a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, and of course we have we have a very successful economy and uh, and uh, standard of living as a result of that. Now we're moving to talking about the uh, international agreements. But first I want to talk a little bit about the IPCC. You've probably heard about this, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. IPCC. The IPCC is the internationally recognized single authoritative voice for advising policymakers on the science of climate change. It was established in 1988 uh, by the World Meteorological Organization, which is, comes under the, uh, the UN. And it's divided into three working groups, uh, physical science, basis of climate change, climate change impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, mitigation of climate change, and they have a task force which develops a national greenhouse gas inventory, which every year is looking at where the greenhouse gas is coming from. And the IPCC provides regular assessments of the scientific basis of climate change, its impacts, future risks, and options for adaption, adaptation, and mitigation. The IPCC is not a big research laboratory. It actually has a pretty modest staff. What it does is it leverage, leverages the uh, resources of the international science community all around the world. And it's, I think it's fair to say that it's, it's, it's a prestigious organization, and for people to collaborate and be involved with the IPCC is considered to be a prestigious thing, so they have no trouble getting people to uh, collaborate with them and contribute to various reports and studies and so forth that, that advise the policymakers. So the IPCC. Again, I think you think of it as being sort of a single international authoritative voice on the science of climate change. Oh, I, I will say, the IPCC has been very conservative. You know, you might hear some people say, oh gosh, the IPCC, they're alarmist, you know, they're trying to 
propagating to all these spheres and so forth. If you go back and look at what they've come out with, you know, historically, and then compare it to what's happening now, you'll find that they've been very conservative. Generally, when they've had to, they made errors, they've erred on the more conservative side, particularly true of sea level. Um, they've talked about and had projections of sea level rise over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. And um, the actual sea level has been rising pretty much along the upper bound with their predictions. So they've been pretty, they're definitely not alarmist, they're kind of conservative. So let's talk about international agreements now. Well, it all began with the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was signed at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. And its objective was, was to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations and to address this problem of anthropogenic climate change. It set non-binding limits on greenhouse uh, gas emissions for individual countries but it contained no enforcement mechanisms, but rather it outlined how specific international treaties should be negotiated to specify further actions toward the objective of the, objective of the UNFCCC. It was signed by pretty much all the nations of the world, and most importantly, it set about having annual conference of the parties, or COP meetings, to assess progress in dealing with climate change and consider additional international agreements these meetings began in 1994, and they were the basis for the, the Kyoto Protocol and the, the Paris Climate Accord. So let's talk about the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol was really the first international treaty that really tried to get a handle on this. Um, it was signed in Japan in 1997 at the third uh, UNFCCC COP meeting. And it committed countries to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and it did it with teeth. It had teeth in it because it, it, it assigned legally binding targets for reduction of CO2 emissions to each country. And there were consequences if you didn't meet those targets. And it also placed more of a general uh, burden on, uh, on uh, developed countries with a significant history of greenhouse gas emission. It also provided for a cap and trade process where countries could do a cap and trade exchange to try to meet their, their quotas. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol was signed by the U.S. in 1998 uh, during the Clinton presidency, but it was not ratified by the Senate. And when President George W. Bush came in, he opposed the protocol and it died at that point in terms of U.S. involvement. The first commitment period started in 2008 and ended in 2012, but um, pretty quickly when the United States failed to ratify, other countries started to pull out, including uh, uh, Canada, Japan, and Russia, essentially. There was an attempt to uh, get it going again with the second uh, commitment period, known as the Doha Amendment, but only 37 countries signed that, and uh, it, it never received sufficient ratification to enter force. So, in general, these are my words, but I think I'm pretty firm ground saying the Kyoto Protocol ended up a disappointing failure. Very unfortunate. And I think I can prove that simply by showing this figure again and showing you that the Kyoto Protocol was signed right here and there's no there's no evidence of it having any impact on on the rise of global emissions. Very unfortunate. Well, the successor to the Kyoto Protocol was in fact the Paris Climate Accord. It was signed at the 21st uh, COP meeting and uh, its goal was to limit the increase in global average temperature to well below 2 degrees centigrade but hopefully down to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Now the first thing that they did was they didn't pass the IPCC to go off and, and do the research to say what's it going to take to achieve these goals. And what the IPCC came back with a couple of years later was, well, to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial by the end of this century, by 2100, we need to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, which basically says we cut emissions by a factor of about two by 2050. To get to, uh, to hold global warming to 2 degrees centigrade by the end of the century, we need to get to carbon neutrality by 2070, cut CO2 emissions by 50% by 2070. So that's kind of the, the balance there we're talking about. Unlike the Kyoto Agreement, the Paris Climate Accord did not have any legally binding limits, did not have any <coughs> legally binding emissions targets, didn't have the teeth the Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol had. Pretty much a volunteer honor system. Uh, 
There was no mechanism to force the country to set a specific target by a specific date. Just kind of peer pressure on the system kind of thing. But even with only that kind of pressure, in June of 2017, President Trump announced his intention to withdraw from the agreement. And uh, the earliest effective date for actual withdrawal will be November 2020, but changes in U.S. policy that are contrary to the agreement have already been put in place. And uh, sadly, there was a 24th COP meeting held in Katowice, Poland in 2018, but it made little progress for establishing rules for implementation of the Paris Accord. So how are we doing with the Paris Accord? Well, um, pretty much all, pretty much um, all the countries of the world have signed the Paris Accord. On the court, and most have ratified. There's only a handful of countries that haven't ratified, and they are kind of uh, pariah states like uh, Libya, Angola, South Sudan, Yemen, um, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, etc. And of course, one and only one country has pulled out the, the parts on the court, and that's the one shown in red here. So, what's the report card and how we're doing? Well, unfortunately, report card is not good. Um, there are these things called annual emission gap reports produced by the UN Environment Program, essentially a report card for how well the countries are doing their party to the Paris Accord. They look at the difference between how much greenhouse gas emissions are needed to be cut to achieve the goals of the Accord and how much these emissions have actually been cut. The 2019 report, which just came out last fall, <coughs> states, quote, the summary findings are bleak, keyword here, bleak, Countries collectively fail to stop the growth in global greenhouse gas emissions, meaning that deeper and faster cuts are now required. It's kind of a pay me now or pay me later situation. Countries will have to increase their carbon cutting ambitions fivefold if the world is to avoid warming by more than 1.5 degrees C by the end of the century. Even if all current emission cuts promised by the Paris Accord are met, the world will still warm by more than 3 degrees C by 2100. Kind of the upper bound of that thing I was showing you before. And richer countries have failed to cut emissions quickly enough, with 15 of the 20 uh, G20 nations having no timeline for net zero CO2 emission target. The, G the G20 nations are responsible for 78% of all emissions, but so far only the EU, UK, Italy, and France have committed to long-term net zero emission targets. Seven G20 nations need to take more action to achieve their promised greenhouse gas emission cuts. That includes Australia, Brazil, Canada, Japan, uh, Republic of Korea, South Africa, and the U.S. So the report card, unfortunately, is not good. We're not up to a good start here. Well, I'm going to end up talking about mitigation. Now, what can we do to get a handle on this? And I want to strongly uh, refer you to a group called Drawdown. They have a, a, a great website called drawdown.org. They also are the authors of a, um, of a New York Times bestseller. It's called Drawdown. It's a group that was founded in 2014 by noted environmentalist uh, Paul Hawken. And um, what it does is it presents 80 solutions. Solutions are uh, technology, combinations of technologies and behaviors designed to address this problem, organized into seven sectors. And they very carefully do economic analysis to price out what the cost of these solutions would be and uh, what, what would be achieved by them what kind of return on investment would be expected and so forth. They did a great job of doing that. Essentially, Drawdown has created a roadmap for the governments of the world to address this problem. And just quickly give you a point for Here are the seven sectors. And in the right-hand column here, the billions of tons of CO2 equivalent that would be uh, reduced over the 30-year period from 2020 to 2050. This is kind of a roadmap of getting to that 2050 Paris Accord. This tells you what you would have to do to get there. In fact, if you implement all the uh, drawdown solutions, you would get to the Paris Accord goal of, of, of carbon neutrality by 2050. My surprise is the biggest one is food. Food is number one by a wide margin. Electric, electricity, electricity generation and power the grid is, is number two. Land use, women and girls. What's women and girls going to do this? Well, it has to do with birth rates. A big part of this is educating women and girls developing countries, and that keeps down the birth rates. And that's an important thing, because each new soul that comes in, into the earth brings with them a carbon to the brain. Materials has to do with recycling, building the cities, building more efficient cities, 
And actually, transportation is the bottom list. You know, transportation uh, globally is not as large as you might think. Now, I don't have time to go through all of these uh, 80 solutions, but I just want to run through the top 20. Just show them to you. If you have interest in we can drill down more. But just to give you a feeling for what they're all about. The number one, which would, which would say 90 billion tons of CO2 equivalent over the next 30 years, is refrigerant management. That's not throwing, that's making sure we don't throw the air conditioners in the landfill, like that, those, those um, F gases, chlorinated gases, get into the atmosphere. Others are probably more familiar to you offshore wind turbines for electricity generation. Reduced food waste, the world throws away about one third of the food produced. And food production has a very high uh, greenhouse gas footprint. So uh, by reducing food waste, there's a freebie right there. Plant rich diet, no, plant rich diet, there's actually about a factor of 10 from going from plant rich diet to a meat oriented diet and greenhouse gas footprint. Family planning, educating girls, solar farms, different ways of, of doing ranching, rooftop solar, pretty obvious. Uh, different ways of doing agriculture, protecting our peatlands. Afforestation is planting forests, but it never were there before. Conservation agriculture, using geothermal energy, managed grazing. Nuclear power is on their list number 20. Um, they see nuclear power as an interim solution, not a long-term solution. An interim solution can help us get where we need to be by 20. 50 or later, but not a long-term solution because of all the problems that come along with nuclear power. So what would it cost uh, to implement drawdown? Well, first of all, uh, if we implemented all these drawdown solutions, they would reduce over 30 years emissions by about 1 trillion tons, which is in the ballpark of where we need to be to achieve the goals of the Paris Accord and hold warming to 1.5 degrees C. What would that cost? Well, it would cost about $30 trillion. $30 trillion over 30 years, which is about one and quarter percent of global GDP. Now, it would be the whole world paying for this, not just the United States. So about one and a quarter percent of global GDP. But the kicker here is it would save about $74 trillion. So there is a return on investment here. You invest $30 trillion over the next 30 years, but you get a return of $74 trillion. Now, by the way, you save the planet. Now, if the, if the cost were apportioned according to um, GDP, then uh, the U.S. would pay about one and a quarter percent of its GDP, which amounts to about 250 billion per year, which is a little more than one third of the U.S. defense budget. So that's large. That's pretty hard to find. You know, pretty hard to find 250 billion in the U.S. budget, but it's not completely inconceivable. It's about one third of the U.S. defense budget. Thank you. You've been a great audience.
and a tendency for uh, um, uh, greater concern with regard to water, uh, decreasing snowpack in the Sierras with federal California, and uh, certainly a, a big concern about a uh, greater tendency for forest fires. Uh, how much will uh, the melting permafrost in Siberia, northern Canada, and Alaska, uh, what impact that have on global warming? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. It turns out that uh, the permafrost in, in Canada and Siberia contains uh, huge amounts of methane. And, uh, you know, methane uh, was the second greenhouse gas on my list there. One thing you should know about methane. In terms of its potency, it's actually 280 times more potent on a molecule by molecule basis than CO2. Um, it only stays in the atmosphere about 10 years compared to CO2, which has an normal life now of about 100 years. So its global warming potential is about 28 times that of CO2. So for every you know every billion tons of methane or every billion tons of methane you put in the atmosphere, it's equivalent to putting 28 billion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. Now there's a huge amount of that trapped in the permafrost. And if you go up there, I've seen film of this, you go up there and you clear off the snow, and see what it looks like, ice, and you see some bubbles down in there, and you break that up with the ice axe, and you'll hear gas outgassing there, hold a match down there, it'll, it'll, it'll light up, it's methane. Well, it turns out that we don't really know when that's going to happen, but the, the thinking right now, because science just isn't that well understood with regard to how much warming is going to cause that methane to be released. But the general thinking is it's probably up around 5 degrees centigrade of global warming. And that's getting pretty close to where we would be by the end of the century under the, under the business as usual scenario. The business as usual scenario was 4.5 degrees plus or minus 1. So if we end up on the high side there, we can hit that 5 degrees plus range, which right now is the conventional wisdom as to when that methane might start to be released. Now if it starts to be released, we will then hit a discontinuity such that warming will significantly accelerate. And that'll be a positive feedback. But the more it warms, the more methane will be released, and we would be really, really in trouble if that happens. Yeah. So getting back to California and sea level rise, yes. so if we don't hit the 2050 target and we go to the top level of your of your projection, what will sea level rise be in California? Do you know? Yeah. Uh, sea level rise is a, is a, I love to talk about sea level rise. And a couple of things I want to leave everybody here with something that very few people know. And that is there is a huge, huge time lag between warming Earth and a rising sea level. So we're all focused on, you know, 2100, but the fact of the matter is the sea level is going to keep on rising. So for example, let's say this, my hand here is, is global mean surface center of the Earth. This is sea level. And we're rising, we're rising. And then we stabilize the temperature at, say, 2 or 3 degrees centigrade, right here. Well, guess what? Sea level is going to keep on rising, keep on rising for many centuries, many centuries, possibly 500 to 1,000 years. Why? Because it takes that long for the ice sheets to adjust to that warmer temperature. It takes that, line, that long, essentially, for all the ice that's going to melt to melt. How do we know that? Well, we can go back and look at the geological record and find events in the past where the Earth was warmer than it is now. We can find a, a, a case where the Earth was three degrees warmer than it is now. Where did the sea level ultimately get after many centuries in those historical records? And the answer is in tens of meters above where it is now. Tens of meters. So in the long term, it's a real problem. We've actually got to bring the temperatures back down to pre-industrial level if we want to maintain a you know, reasonable sea level. But the question you're asking is, where are we going to be in Monterey County by the end of, of, of this century? And the answer is probably pretty close to the global mean average rise, which right now is, is, looks like it's going to be about one meter. But um, there have been, it continually gets being revised upward, mainly because the Antarctic ice sheet is melting faster than we've expected. We don't really understand all the physics there that well. But as we understand more and more, it looks like it's going to melt faster and faster, primarily because there's more warm water coming under the ice shelf, ice shelf there. So it's not at all, it wouldn't be at all out of that surprising if we ended up actually seeing two meters of, of sea level rise by the end of this century. And you have to realize that's the mean sea level. On top of that, you've got tides, you've got storms, you've got you know effects of surf and so forth. And you can actually have events that go much higher than that. So yes, it's going to be it's going to be an issue by the end. What it really takes off is after 2050. 
if you look at the projections, where the sea level really rise really starts to take off is after 2050, and that's because that's when it's predicted that um, the um, Antarctic ice sheet will start melting significantly faster. If you melted all the ice in the Antarctic ice sheet, the global sea levels would rise about 57 meters, um, and that's you know, honoring would be well in water. But, but it would be more than that, because the, the ocean would expand, and thermal expansion is about half, driving about half of sea level rise. So, you know, um, it, it ultimately, sea levels, I mean, sea levels in the past have been as high as 110 meters above where they are now. So, um, you know, it might be many centuries into the future before that happens, but it's certainly within their own possibility. And this, by the way, raises a question I like to always think about, and that is, one question we have to all ask ourselves is, do we care about the fate of future generations? And do we care about what future generations are going to think about us? Because we're talking about many generations in the future. A lot of these things happen. Do we care? I hope we do. I hope we care about the fate of future generations. And I hope we care about what they're going to think about us. Because believe me, they're going to look back and say, why the hell did you people back in the 21st century address this problem when it was relatively easy to address? And we push it off to us and we're having a time. Thank you very much for that, that presentation. I thought it was just terrific. Thank you. I've heard many presentations over the years on climate change, and this was by far the best. Thank you. Being both uh, very factual and taking a long-range perspective and very low-key. Thank you so much. So my question for you is, have you had any luck getting your presentation uh, in front of influential people who are resisting and opposing a lot of these efforts in government and business circles? And is there more you can do to, to get this type of a presentation? I don't know if it needs to be refined a little bit, but a lot of these people just have to understand this. Yes. And it seems like unless they're totally dishonest, they don't understand it. I, I, do have, I do have a YouTube channel, which I've just recently created, and I'm, and I'm putting all my presentations on there, including this one I'm filming back here. And I'm hoping that that YouTube channel will get some wide circulation. Um, I haven't made an attempt to um, speak in front of uh, policymakers. While we're talking about policymakers, by the way, I want to put in a plug for Jenny Panetta. Our congressman has been a real leader on this issue. He's a part of the Climate Solutions Caucus, and he has is, is authored one of, of four bills that are going forward in Congress on carbon pricing. So he's been a real leader there, and I think we're really blessed to have him we're representing us on Congress on this matter. Well, Mike, thanks for a wonderful context for this issue. Um, <laughs> and, uh, our appreciation. Here's some very nice wine from local vineyards. Thank you. I hope you enjoy that. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you at the Hilton.